Good morning and welcome to worship. From my home to yours, I hope that today's worship is edifying and uplifting for everyone who's joining us today. A few things, one, a reminder, or if you're new to us, there will be opportunity for our collective prayers to be heard today. And so if you would like something added, a Thanksgiving or a concern, please use the Q&A button and those will be collected and offered up during the prayers of intercession. Also, uh, immediately following the service and the prelude, we will be having a congregational meeting. I'll give a bit more instruction, but you will find the link to that at the end of the service on the final um, PowerPoint slide. And those of you who are calling in on the telephone, you need not um, hang up and redial. You can just stay on the line and you will be automatically joined to the meeting. A celebration this week with our food handout, 18 families were fed and that's quite a number of people. So we give thanks for those who assembled the bags and handed them out and do the food link orders. This week we also received over 800 pounds of food from Food Link to be given out. And so we are grateful for that resource that we can share. And now as we gather for worship, we light a candle. Take a breath and give thanks for our baptism. We are gathered in the name in which we are baptized, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery to freedom. At the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. There is no east or west, in him no south or north, but one great community of love throughout the whole wide earth. In Christ shall true hearts everywhere their high communion find. Disciples of the faith, whatever your race may be, all children of the living God are surely kin to me. In Christ now meet both east and west, in him meet south and north. All Christly souls are one in him throughout the whole wide earth. Amen. 
Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, Alleluia. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Loving Lord, your followers were faithful, even in the face of strong opposition. Give us their courage and conviction to be worthy proclaimers of the gospel of grace. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to invite you to take a minute and find the chat button, the green button, or the orange button on the bottom of your, of your screen, because we're going to talk about things we're thankful for. See, what's going what's gonna to guide us um, in our time together today, kids, is some of the, one of the letters in the Bible. The Apostle Paul went from town to town, and he would start churches or help people who were gathered to start churches, and then he would move on. And they didn't have email, and they didn't have Zoom. They had good old-fashioned letters. So Paul would write out a letter in longhand, and he would send it with a messenger who would go back to that town. And, and they would then read the letter, because a lot of people couldn't read in those days. And they would read the letter to the whole community. And it was a lovely event. And one of the best things about all of these letters and these events of reading was how Paul starts off his letters. And he starts off with, I thank God for you. So while I'm talking, you feel free to type in there what you're thankful for. Because Paul would go on and he would talk about <coughs> the work that the people were doing in these communities and how they were loving each other and how they were taking care of each other. He would lift that up and read that. And since you can all see, and I'm not seeing much going on down there right now, folks, um, kids and adults are welcome to type in the things they're thankful for. There was a town called Thessalonica, and it's in Greece. And, um, and Paul starts off, and actually his entire letter is written about Thanksgiving. He says to those people, I thank God for you. I thank God for you because... Because you're telling each other about Jesus. I thank God for you because you're taking care of the people in your community. I thank God for you because you're praying for each other. I thank God for you because you heard the message of how you're supposed to live now that you know Jesus. Being kind and caring for each other. And even on the days when you can't do it very well, well, I'm thankful that you have that knowledge in your head and in your hearts, and you are constantly being changed to be the people that God called you to be. The letter just goes on and on, kids. It's awesome. Paul is so thankful for them. And I am thankful for you. I gathered with some of the kids yesterday for confirmation, and, and they had a lot of things they were thankful for. And I was thankful to see them to meet their pets, and to hear their answers, and to learn their questions, and to see how well they've learned technology so much better than me. I'm thankful that when we talked about the parts of worship, they could talk about their favorite parts. I'm thankful that you are all doing your schoolwork. I'm thankful that you have this opportunity. I'm thankful that you have wonderful families and a church community that loves you. I'm thankful for all of these things and so many, many more. Let's ask God to help us to remember how thankful we are every day. Hey God, there's lots of things to be thankful for. The biggest is you and second to it is each other. Help us God to keep remembering that you're in our lives, that you've sent us Jesus to walk with us, and that we are your people, and you never stop loving us. Thank you, God. And all God's children said, amen. Amen. 
Living God, help us so to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from St. Mark. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of birth pangs. As for yourselves, Beware, for they will hand you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings because of me as a testimony to them. And the good news must first be proclaimed to all nations. When they bring you to trial and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
Halle, Halle, Halle. from 1st Thessalonians. To the Church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before God, our God and Father, your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. As we've been in this 50-day period of prayer and discernment that began with Easter, have you been thinking as I have about the illusions that we live with, those things that we assume about life, the realities that have guided our, our how we live and how we interact with one another, how we perceive the world around us? It's been eye-opening for me as I contemplate all the things that I've always assumed, the way I've rationalized my own existence now that the world is different. You know, I, uh, I hate to admit it, but I've always kind of worked under the belief that, well, I'm pretty darn independent, that I can take care of myself, my family, my congregation. I single-handedly could run my home and my own life, it's mine. That anything I need is always available to me as long as I have the resources to, to pay for it. And then, and then this global pandemic struck and uh, it turns out that I need a lot of people. I think maybe some of you got the email from me that said that um, if it wasn't like for, for Jeff and Julie and Dave and Vicki and, and the likes, uh, we'd still be, we'd be doing like smoke signals or, or something in order to have worship. And, and I realize I'm dependent on other people I never even thought about. And, and you know, for a while, I couldn't find toilet paper. And I, I realized I don't need all those things that I thought I needed, but I sure do need God. And I most certainly need you. So this week, <clears throat> in light of the text that I just read, I've been pondering about that ancient city of Thessalonica. It was situated perfectly, just perfectly on a major trade route. And <laughs> it was sitting right on the Gulf of the Aegean Sea. And it was a great city of wealth and culture, fortified twice over to become an impenetrable military base. The people who lived there had everything they need. Nobody could sneak in and harm them. It was mighty and it was prosperous. It was the most important Macedonian port. And as far as culture and intellect and politics, it was second only to Constantinople. 
And this city thrived for centuries as a center for architecture and intellect and independence. So imagine living there, free citizens, mostly living tax exempt lives, truly. It was a plethora of temples where you could go and worship whatever God you chose to adore and thank for the blessings that just sort of seemed to fall from the sky day after day upon you. And so imagine the illusions the Thessalonians lived with, anything they ever could want or imagine. It's right there at their fingertips and people from the known world traipsed through their city to trade and to learn to wander and to indulge themselves. And you and your city are literally the center of the universe. Although within those walls are, are also the working class, the stone masons that made that fortification possible, the household slaves who kept the day-to-day -day life running, those who could see the opulence and the glamour of the wealthy, but who never could aspire to touch it. And there's also a Jewish contingent inside the city, a place of prayer where the devout could gather to worship the God of Israel. And into, those, into that city, through those thick walls, right up to that place of prayer, arrives the Apostle Paul with a message for Jew and Gentile alike. He spent three days in that synagogue arguing that Jesus Christ was the anointed one, the coming Messiah, the expected savior of the nations. He ranted on and on about how it was necessary for Jesus to suffer and die and rise from the dead, certainly a countercultural message to the people who were listening. He argued with Greek and Israelite alike. He told stories of Jesus' teachings and miracles, admonished the listeners to believe, to set aside all of their illusions of what life should be like. He demanded they set aside their illusions of what a savior should look like. He laid before them an opportunity to become changed, transformed, even disillusioned. Now we think of disillusionment as a negative, as a way of becoming depressed and despondent. But imagine for a moment with me that being disillusioned is merely a setting aside of what we cling to that holds us back from who God is calling us to be. Imagine we can cast aside the distractions and the rationalizations that have held us captive. The distractions, the knowledge, the rationalizations of the Thessalonians were, were easy. They had convinced themselves that if you had more, you were more blessed, more deserving, more important. They convinced themselves that a hierarchy was the way to live, that the underclass were meant to serve the upper class that there are people destined, destined for wealth while others were destined to struggle. And that it was really none of their concern to make a change. They lived with the ideal that having more is better, that doing more is better, that bigger is better. That they had control over their own destiny and by their own independent actions, they could secure a safe and healthy and prosperous future. And into those assumed realities and illusions, Paul offers something crazy different. A life around a savior who lived dependent on the hospitality of others. A savior who was abused and beaten, suffered and died for the sake of the world. Paul paints a picture of a kingdom where all people are welcomed and valued and loved and a set of mores that values people over wealth. 
a reality where all are to be viewed as beloved throughout the letter to the Thessalonians, Paul calls them beloved over and over again, and he guides them on a path of sacrificial living for the sake of others. And suddenly slaves, stonemasons, wealthy women are coming together to be part of a church, a people of prayer, a faithful community where all are equal in value. <laughs> That's an amazing shift. It's huge. It's huge. What caused them to drop their illusions of social class and hierarchy? What caused them to set aside their privilege? What caused them to assume the mantle of love for others to care for the neighbor, no matter who the neighbor was, and adopt an attitude of thanksgiving in all things? Well, the only answer is it's the compelling message of the gospel, as it was shared by an enthusiastic believer. The compelling message of the gospel had transformed Paul from a persecutor of, of Christians to an exemplary missionary, and this is just one of the examples of his work. But you know, the transition and the shift in the lives of the Thessalonians is not so different from the shift that's happening in our lives. A shift not only because of a virus, but more so because of the reality of the gospel as it was proclaimed by Jesus and taught by Paul. Life as we know it will never go back to what it was and our illusions fade in the light of day. We are now acutely aware that those who put groceries on our shelf and clear, clean the floor of the hospitals and tend to the sick and take away our garbage and so on are the true heroes in our lives. The people upon whom the rhythm of life depends and that all work has value and all vocations have purpose. We're learning that we are responsible for one another and our actions impact the lives of others. What is coming to light, I think, is that the transformative presence of Jesus Christ, no, I know that the transformative presence of Jesus Christ is creating in each and every one of us a new reality, a kingdom reality, a disillusioned reality. The love we share, the bonds of our faith, they transcend space and allow us to really be together even from a distance. Being secure in the love of God for each of us is as important as doing and more important than busyness. Sacrificial living for one another is the key to our communal life in Christ. All of these things are bubbling up in these days of prayer and discernment as we ponder the transforming presence of Christ in Thessalonica and in our lives. And so in the words of Paul, I give thanks to God for all of you, remembering before our God and Father, your work of faith and labor and love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh,
tidings, for tidings of peace, tidings of Jesus' redemption and release, published to every people, tongue, and nation, that God in whom they live and move is love. Tell how he stooped to save his lost creation and died on earth that we might live above. Publish glad tidings, tidings of peace, tidings of Jesus, redemption and release. He comes again, O Zion, ere you meet him, make known to every heart his saving grace. Let none whom he has ransomed fail to greet him, through your neglect unfit to see his face. Publish glad tidings, tidings of peace, tidings of Jesus, redemption and release. Let us confess our common Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one oh God. God. That the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We pray for the church the world, and all those in need. We are quick to take offense, O Lord, and slow to listen when our assumptions are questioned. Open our minds to the transforming power of your word, new to us each day. Empowering God, hear our prayer. Hear prayer. Too often, we use the resources of this planet for our own enjoyment, entertainment, and convenience without thought of the damage we might be doing. Forgive us and turn us back to the one who created all things, that we might responsibly resume the role of your faithful stewards. Empowering God, hear our prayer. Your early disciples relied heavily on the Spirit's power to guide them through every obstacle they faced. Give us a faith like theirs, which enables us to take bold risks for the sake of spreading the gospel. Empowering God, hear our prayer. We give you thanks for the renewal of the earth, a reminder of your love for your creation and for us. Empowering God, hear our prayer. Guide our local, state, national, and world leaders in making the hard decisions that must be made now and in the future endow them with wisdom and compassion. Empowering God, hear our prayer. 
Grant the victims of the coronavirus healing, ease, and loving care as they suffer through and recover from their illness. Be with their families and console those who live now in anxiety and grief. Empowering God, hear our prayer. Support and comfort the medical personnel who are exposed every day to infection and stress as they stretch to provide critical care for those in need. Empowering God, hear our prayer. Give your tender care and healing to all those who need it this day, especially Empowering God, hear our prayer. We stand in a long line of saints who dedicated their lives to spreading your truths and standing for mercy and grace. Inspire us by their witness and make us the kind of followers who encourage others to embrace your mission. Empowering God, hear our prayer. Hear now the deepest desires of our hearts. Prayers for Lisa as the custody has still not resolved. Prayers it will be fair to Gianna and resolve quickly. Prayers for G. Prayers for God to uplift him into his hands, giving him peace. Prayers for the family of my cousin Matt, who died suddenly. Empowering God, hear our hear prayer. Our prayer. We offer these prayers to your safekeeping and trust that you have heard us. For the sake of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the one who brought forth Jesus from the dead raise you to new life, fill you with hope, and turn your mourning into dancing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you, now and forever. Amen. And now before we pass the peace, just a reminder and some information about the meeting. Again, if you're on the phone, just hang on and you will automatically be joined into the meeting. If you are online, um, the meeting will not open until the postlude is concluded so that Jeff can close out one and open the other. So please be patient as he switches meetings and wait until the conclusion of the postlude to join the meeting. Um, once we finished our business, we will indeed have coffee hour and an opportunity to socialize. And now as Willie plays the postlude, the peace of Christ be with you always. Please share a sign of peace with one another using the chat window.
See you at the congregational meeting.